It's been an exciting worship Devo already. I hope you're ready for the Word of God. You know, it's exciting that tonight we're going to be able to give God all the glory. We're going to have this Devo, we're going to have a concert, and after this Devo, we're going to have a baptism. What does it take to change this world into a Christian world? What does it take for every single church to have multitudes of campus disciples? What does it take? It takes all of us being bold as lions. What do you know about a lion? All I know about a lion is that lions are bold. And my prayer for every one of you isn't to walk away from this conference wanting to be like one of these leaders. It's to be like Jesus, the boldest lion of all. I have no doubt that all of you are going to walk out of this conference transformed. I have no doubt that every campus ministry in the sold out movements going to double in size in 2019. And I pray that this sermon is the sermon that ignites a fire in some of your hearts and all of your hearts to be bold as a lion. We're all going to shed tears this weekend. We're all going to build memories. We're all going to have hope in our hearts. Some of us might start dating. <laughs> but without further ado, let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll jump into the scriptures. Father in heaven, our boldest lion. Our King among kings, Lord of lords, we are unworthy of calling you our God. We've all fallen short. Some of us are short. <laughs> but you give us giant faith. Lord, at this point in time, in this moment, I pray you fill this room with the Holy Spirit, with thousands of angels to rejoice with us, as this truly will be the spark that starts a fire in every one of our cities, that all of our campuses will hear the word of God, that each of us decides to be bold as lions. Lord, please open up the floodgates of the Holy Spirit. Let the word of God reach all of our hearts. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. The first point. The first point is bold lions overcome the battles. In verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. I read this scripture because there's two trustworthy sayings in all of your life, all of your lives. Is Jesus Christ the Savior, and you're the worst sinner? All of us can relate with what Paul said here. But I want to share personally. I had been plagued with thoughts of depression and hardship since I was a wee little lad. I'll never overcome. I'm a failure. I'm worthless. Nobody gets me. I don't know myself. I'm never good enough. I'm just a filler. What I've done can't be forgiven. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. 
as a bold lion, all of us need to overcome the battles. I've sat in such dark darkness that I could feel it. As a disciple, I'm ashamed to say that I have fallen away three times. I have left God, my Savior, three times. But I've been restored. And I've come back. And I will never give up. What rings more true than me being the worst of sinners is Jesus Christ as Lord. What rings more true is because of the stuff I've gone through, stuff you've gone through, you're now an example of God's mercy, aren't you? You have no reason to be afraid of what has happened to you and through you. Because those things are what not define you. What defines you is Jesus Christ. I believe many of us get stuck in the wrong definition of who we are. We get defined by the color of our skin, by our families, by our cultures, by our schools, and worst of all, our failures. There's a quote that I read. There can be no failure to a man who has not lost his courage, his self-respect, or his confidence. He is still king. The Bible says that the righteous fall, but they will always get back up. See, what's a fact is the day you got baptized is you received a crown. You became a king and a queen in the kingdom of God. And that crown can never be taken off. You just cannot lose your faith in Jesus. My hope is to inspire you guys to overcome your personal battles. So let's take a look at the king, David, in the Old Testament. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We all know the story. David took out Goliath. But we don't talk much when Goliath took out David. Chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. This was a day where the king fell. When everyone else was going out to war, when he was supposed to go, he sent everyone else to do what he was supposed to be doing. He sleeps with his best friend's wife. Lusting out a window. He ends up killing his best friend, killing, right? And here he is in the darkness, the one that was supposed to bring Jesus to the earth, a failure. You know, later, one of his best friends, Nathan, rebukes his face off. What are you doing? I know what you've done. It's obvious what you've done. 
Repent. It's been months, David. Get real. David says, you're right. I've been in sin. He weeps. He prays. His son was taken away from him. Through the mercy of God, Solomon came through that sin. Because he is now a mercy, an example of mercy. But there's a scripture in the moment where David decided to repent in his heart. And I want to turn to it. But before I go there, are any of you in this place right now? If you are, get back up. Just get up. Disciples can never fail. Because you can always get back up. The harder you fall, the harder you rise. So go to Psalm 51.10 and watch David's heart transform before the Lord. This is when Nathan came to him after David committed adultery of Bathsheba. In verse 10, you know, we'll start in verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This scripture literally defines my life. And for every one of you, if you have fallen, it can define yours as well. See, a lot of us are fighting to create in ourselves the pure heart. We are fighting for our own will and spirit. Somehow we've taken the, uh, the concept of the law of attraction and, and made it true. It is not true. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. God gives you the willing and sustaining spirit. Not some force inside of you. If that was true, Jesus would not have been on the cross because he did a lot of good. The law of attraction is a law of lies. Here's what I'm teaching you. Only God can give you a pure heart. Only God can give you a sustained spirit. And only God can bring you true joy. As you take a look at your own heart tonight, are you fighting the battles without God in your heart? See, bold lions overcome the battles. I want to turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. And uh, verse 13, it says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward, in Christ Jesus. See, what's amazing about David in Psalm 51 is he pressed on. He didn't stay down. He got back up. And he said, forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. See, here's the thing. I'm never good enough. We'll never define you ever again. It's time to move forward. Christ made me good enough. I'm worthless. Will never define you again because Christ made you worth it. What I've done 
can't be forgiven. From now on, that will not define you. Because Christ forgives all sin. Forget what is behind. Your past does not define you anymore, my brother and my sister. Jesus defines you. That is the only way to be bold as lions in the battle. One of my favorite movies is Gladiator. Goodness gracious. Everything is taken from you. Can you imagine, those of you who have seen this movie, walking home and seeing your son, I think it was his son and his wife, hanging on a tree, burnt, hung. His position in the kingdom was taken. And then he was sold into slavery. Can you imagine that? He was bold as a lion. That guy overcame the battle. His fierceness to get back and have vengeance should match your fierceness to get back up and live for Jesus. He ends up defeating the Caesar that killed his father and his family and reunited with his family in the end. See, what I'm teaching here is that you guys have to have a battle to fight that's worth more than your past. What is ahead of you needs to mean more to you than what's behind you. What is behind you needs to mean less than what is ahead of you. And if you can live in that mindset, you will overcome your battles as bold lions. Point number two, bold lions rise above the odds. Daniel chapter 6. We're going to read about, of course, Daniel in the den of lions. I mean, we have to talk about that this weekend. Bold as lions. We're going to start in verse 10. Of course, there was an edict passed where nobody could pray to God. They had to pray to uh, basically Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, Daniel doesn't have none of that. He says, no way. I'm going to be a follower of God. So in verse 10, he says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into a lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Your majesty or the decree you have put in writing, he still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. See, this king's fault was that he thought he could save Daniel, not God. He literally thought he was a savior. Daniel was not having none of that. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, who you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. Bold lions rise above the odds. I was writing this sermon, and uh, if you can't see the notes, it literally looks like I'm crazy, okay? Okay. 
I don't know what it was. I just, I couldn't write. I felt, man, are you even supposed to preach? Are you, what, what's going on? Anxiety started creeping in. You guys know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, my beautiful wife texts me. You're going to do a great job on your lesson. You're so inspiring and give vision and your life always impacts people. Every day, my wife fills me with those words because she knows my battles. My wife helps me overcome my odds. I might be odd, but I got a lot of odds against me. But I believe that God put her into my life as an angel. She's a messenger for me. You know, of course, Daniel had an angel in the lion's den. I got, a, I got an angel in my life. Now, those of you who are campus disciples and not married or dating, who's your angel? Who's your messenger? Do you shut off from the encouragement you should be getting? When God is trying to shut the mouth of the lions, are you shutting out the kingdom of God? So many disciples struggle and they struggle and they struggle. All the odds against them financially, physically, mentally, spiritually, and they just shut out the kingdom. They shut out the family. And therefore, they shut out God's voice. I want to encourage you guys to overcome the odds. You need an angel. And I want to encourage you. We are in each other's lives to encourage one another to get to heaven, to shut the mouth of the lion. Like Josh said, to kick out the devil. All of us have odds against us. And I want you to count how many odds are against you and realize everyone in this room has just as much odds against them as well. And if you were to accept that you're not the only one, you can overcome because we can all do this together. Amen. Selfishness does not lead to a spiritual life. When it's all about you, it's not all about God. Disciples can't get stuck in me. It just stinks. It's the worst place to be when it's all about you. It's a really dark place. You're not going to overcome the odds all about you. I'm awesome. I'm great. I've got all this. I'm the right hand guy. I'm the intern. I'm the Bible talk leader. Me, 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 me. You can just sing that all day, can't you? Me, 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 me. Hey, that's great. How was your quiet time? Well, I uh, didn't have one. Hey, Amen. It's all good. The only way you're going to rise above the odds is if you're with God. If you let his angel speak to you, that's how we're going to do this together, guys. It is so inspiring. Two weekends ago, our brother Zach Dryden was restored to the Lord. And he overcame the odds. We had a really tough talk. I mean, he, he just said, you don't listen to my heart. I'm like... I've been listening to your heart for like an hour now. I don't... <laughs> Matt was there. I was like, oh, I'm going to get discipled, you know. And I just looked at Zach. I said, Zach, I am not giving up on you. I love you the same like I loved you the day I met you. You're going to stick with me. I'm like glue, bro. I looked him in the eyes, and we had a moment. Another couple tough talks. One day I said, bro, I'm going to give you a challenge. You're going to have two quiet, two hour quiet times every single day, and you're going to give me every detail of your day every day for 30 days. And he went after it. He's like, bro, thank you so much. He opened his heart to the messenger. 
And he said, God is so good. God has given me strength to overcome everything. I'm like, yeah, it's not odd that God gives you strength to overcome the odds. Bro, you're great. One day he said, bro, I don't know if I could do this. Have a quiet time. Did you go two hours? I went like one hour, 45 minutes. 15 more minutes, bro. You got this. <laughs> Zach, I love you, bro. Zach got up from the ground and overcame all odds against him. Because he went to God and he listened to the angels God put in his life. There's a, <laughs> from the We Are Marshall movie that Peter brought up, there's a, my favorite speech. And it, it, it inspires me because so many of us forget that to overcome odds, we're going to have to go through battles we can't even imagine. The Bible is filled with opportunities to overcome the odds. Jesus himself, Elijah, Daniel, there's so many odds against Daniel right here. And then literally the king said, there's no way for you to get out of this situation. There's a stone in front of the lions. And you're surrounded by lions. In the morning he came up and he said, may the king live forever. And the king goes, you probably live forever. But in the movie, there's a scene where they're about to go into the, the game, and he stands on the campus, and it was what Peter mentioned about the plane crash, and it, they were feeling it. And he gives this speech that, that will move anyone's heart, but I'm probably going to butcher it, but just stick with me. He says, this is our past, gentlemen. This is where we have been. This is how we got here, and this is who we are. Today, I want to talk to you about our opponent this afternoon. They're bigger, faster, stronger, more experienced, and on paper, they're just better. And they know it, too. But I want to tell you something that they don't know. They don't know your heart. I do. I've seen it. You've shown it to me. You have shown this coaching staff, your teammates. You have shown yourselves just exactly who you are in here. When you take that field today, you've got to lay that heart on the line. From the soles of your feet with every ounce of blood you've got in your body, lay it on the line until the final whistle blows. And if you do that, if you do that, we cannot lose. We may be behind on the scoreboard at the end of the game, but if you play like that, we cannot be defeated. How you play today, from this moment on, is how you will be remembered. This is your opportunity to rise from these ashes and grab glory. Bold lions, overcome the odds. And how you do it is you got to put it all on that line. Everybody makes fun of my red face. I don't care. I'm giving everything I've got. Blood vessels popping headache afterwards. I lost 10 pounds. But I don't just do this when I'm behind this microphone. And neither should you. See, when you go back home and you walk on your field, your campus, your high schools, you take that field. You put your heart out there. You give it everything you've got, and you do not pull back. you got 60,000 students against you, and you are just one. Well, it just takes one to start a fire. It takes one person to overcome the odds. It takes one campus disciple to multiply into two, into four, into eight, and beyond, if you're with God. I want to inspire you to be bold as a lion and overcome the odds against you. One of the things that, uh, that Peter Markarian, 
goodness, bro. You are one of the most faithful serving men I've ever met in my life. You've been such a light in my life. He gets scrutinized on his speaking all the time. And you know what? That was probably one of the best welcomes I've ever seen in my life. Peter is a man that has stood against the odds in his speaking, in his effectiveness, in his life, because he is with God. So why don't you write down one thing that is against you, that you need to have God in, and why don't you just go and overcome that? Why don't you just go ahead and do it? Point number three, bold lions are heroes in the faith. For Samuel 17. Of course, I got to talk about David and Goliath. Now, we know the story. The pebble hit him in the forehead. He falls over. I want to read the part that inspires me. And it's in verse 52. So this is after Goliath falls. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout, and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gate of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherem road and to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered the camp. Why does that inspire me? It's not what David did. It's the effect of what David did. See, David could have slown Goliath and gotten glory for himself. But he inspired everyone else to slay their Goliath. All the Israelites saw it, and they all stood up, and they shouted, and they defeated the Philistines, and they got some plunder. He inspired an entire nation. His heroic act inspired every soul to take the reins and defeat the enemies for Christ. Too many of us are waiting for a hero when we need to be a hero. Too many of us want to be a hero for the attention instead of giving the attention to those we lead. I want to challenge you for the rest of 2019 to never boast about yourself. To never talk about your role. To never talk about your awesome deeds, but to talk about God's awesome deeds. To talk about Tyler's awesome deeds. To talk about Josh Galindo's awesome deeds. Raja's awesome deeds. The kingdom's awesome deeds. Be heroic in what you do, not in what you say. We need less talk about tomorrow's victories. And we need more victories today. Do you want to be a hero? A bold as a lion hero in the faith? Do something heroic. And don't say anything about it. That's a hero. When you do something heroic, other people will say something about it. And then they'll do something that's heroic, and other people will be talking about it. That will inspire all nations to follow Jesus. See, I think we spend a lot of time talking about what we do. Not enough about doing it. You just got to do it and crank it and keep doing it and don't talk about it. Watch what God does. It's amazing to see what God is doing through our brother, Isaac Gonzalez. Where's Isaac? Isaac cranks. Big plans for Isaac. One of the things that you rarely hear from Isaac is the things he does. Let me just tell you, since I've gotten here, he's been fruitful at least one time a month. 
He's been so fruitful, so helpful, so serving, so humble. He met this guy, Alex and Gunho, up there. Raise your hand, Alex. He's got bigger biceps than my head. He reached out to Alex, and Alex reaches out to David, who's right next to him. Brad Pitt over there. Alex, who has yet to be baptized, reaches out to David. David gets baptized first. And we go, whoa, that's awesome. Isaac's just like, amen, God is good. Bro, you met Alex. Who met David? God's good, bro. And then David baptizes Alex. I'm like, bro, Isaac, look how fruitful you are. God is good, bro. I mean, be honest. That's heroic. And then be honest. Be honest with yourself. Would you be talking a lot about that? Be honest. Like, would you be talking a lot about how awesome you are? Be honest. It's okay. We've all been there. But I want you to imitate Isaac's heart. Because he did something heroic. Somebody else did something heroic. And Isaac has been a staple part of this campus ministry multiplying from 7 to 28. Very proud of you, bro. Now, I don't have time, but I want to say that Jesus is the prime example of this. In John 12, he says that, a seed needs to die in order for it to multiply. In John 19, he does that thing. He dies. And then turn to me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Oh, I've heard this one before. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. I've been honored to be surrounded by heroes in my faith. Since day one, Mike Patterson has been a hero in the faith to me. Now, Mike isn't the most perfect person in the world. But Mike gave me my dreams. In Portland, Oregon, where I was baptized, it was struggling. Mike came up to me one day and said, bro, you want to live a dream? Sure. Moved to Phoenix, Arizona with me. When? In two days. Well, well, let's go. I'll quit my two jobs and leave my apartment and we're good. Really? Let's go. Mike, you're a hero to me, bro. I'm so grateful for your friendship, for your love over the years, and I pray that you're bold as a lion and you overcome. Got a hero right here named Chris Klopek. How you doing? He came up to me right before here, and he, and he, he said, uh, I've learned so much from you. He said that to me. Chris, I've learned so much from you, bro. I, I, I respect you so much, you and your wife, Sonia. Bro, you were one of my first church leaders. And uh, I still know, uh, keep your eye on the ball sermon. I know about that one. <laughs> but what I remember you for, <laughs> what I remember you for is all that you gave up to go into ministry. And that's why I respect you and love you so much. I just got two more heroes to talk about. Luke Speckman. You guys, if you don't know Luke, you better get some time with him. <laughs> Luke actually restored me all three times. <laughs> He also kicked me out all three times, but I mean. <laughs> but there was a moment we had just a little while ago that defines Luke. He comes up, he goes, bro, this just happened. You know, he like builds things up before he says something. Like, oh, you know it's going to be good, right? Yeah. And he shows a picture, he's like, pow. And we're like, whoa. I was like, oh my gosh. He literally saw an iguana outside. He grabbed it by the hand. Or by <laughs> He's like, he takes a picture. He, he took the time to take the picture of the iguana in his hand. He said the iguana was whipping his arm and everything. I was like, bro, I went fishing with Matt the other day. There's an iguana in the tree above my head. And I was like, ah! I was like, Godzilla! You know? Luke's just like, like, what the world? Luke's always grabbed the iguana by the head. 
You've always been that way, bro. I, 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 you were talking about ASU the other day, and I remember that day. I remember, dude, with you and Brandon just cranking away, going crazy, and you just preached. Like, you just had a baby. It was insane. You're insane. <laughs> but I love you with all my heart, bro. You are a hero to me, bro. Uh, you guys know I got to talk about Matt. I'm emotional, so don't judge me, Ryan. Bro, you, you've given me life. You threw me out to the lions because you knew I could handle it. You married T and I. You appointed me as an evangelist when most people didn't think I could even tie my shoe. <laughs> but you're my best friend, bro. I, get, I give you everything I've got because you gave me everything you've got. It's very rare that you rebuke me, but when you do, it feels good. You, you don't give up on me, bro. I love you so much. And, and guys, without Matt and Helen, we would not be here. Your faith inspires me, bro. From day one, from the first time I really met you, when Jamal said, Matty Matt, give me the patty pat. In Phoenix, Arizona. It was amazing. But, bro, thank you so much for your devotion and your love to me, bro. You're a hero to me. So before I read this scripture, who is your hero in the faith? I didn't even mention Raja. But for you guys, who's your hero in the faith? And then who are you a hero to? I want to call you to be a bold hero in the faith. Like Peter right here. You guys ready? Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. One man dying became 3,000. Through Jesus' death, Peter was able to multiply to 3,000 men and women. Or 3,000 men, really. And I want to ask you, can you do that as well? Can you do something so heroic that so many people are inspired by Jesus that they repent and get baptized? You know the answer? Yes. Yes, you can. And you will. What's inspiring is tonight our soon-to-be brother Rakeem is about to be baptized. The brothers in Gainesville were heroic in their faith. Reached out to him, preached the word to him, and tonight he decided to be baptized because the brothers were heroic. My call for this whole entire sermon is by April 1st, be a hero to someone. Call them to repent and be baptized, every one of you. Guys, we have to be bold as lions to God be all the glory.